now, here's your hosts, The League Dad, Kevin, Mitchell, and Alistair. What's up, gamers, and welcome to another episode of the All In Podcast. I am The League Dad, and as always, I'm joined by my friends and buddies and co-hosts. We've got Kevin, Mitchell, and Alistair. Uh, Thanks for being here, guys. Uh, I'm still high from the games this weekend and just all the excitement that was at uh, the State Farm Arena where me and Alistair did get to end up meeting and watching the games. And man, I don't know if, uh, you know, this is my first experience going to any type of League of Legends live event and what an event to go to. Uh, So, I mean, I know I had a great weekend and I'll share a little bit more, uh, but um, I'd like to hear what you guys thought. You know, I know it was exciting no matter what, uh, we got to feel the live presence, but I'm sure it was just as exciting uh, watching on, on your computers and watching uh, the games happening as they unfolded. But what did you guys think? Overall reactions uh, to the games and, and the results? Yeah, uh, overall reactions. I mean, day one was really exciting. I think it started off on a high. It did kind of peter out as it went up, but I think the match quality for at least two or three of it were really high. Um, so I had a great time watching that. And then day two, low expectations, but man, it... My expectations were blown out of the water. I thought up until like game two, I was like, well, you know, this is what we expected. And then everything just became magical afterward. Yeah. It was it was nuts, honestly. I mean, from, I did not think it would get as loud as it did at 2016 Summer Finals. It got a lot louder. Yeah. It was really loud. You couldn't hear the casters or anything. Like, it, they were drowned out. I may have gotten both my predictions wrong, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think um, some players had a really rough series. I think uh, Peanut and Hope uh, did not really perform. But aside from that, like, I-, I had a great time. I'm looking forward to the finals. Yeah, it was uh, it was a crazy time. I, I watched them um, live uh, with like some friends at a play- play- uh, friend's house. And um, it was crazy, just like yelling at the screen. Honestly, um, Saturday, JDG versus T1. It was actually my birthday. And, oh, uh, yeah. Happy birthday, so man. all I wanted was for T1 to win, and then they clutched it out, and it was pretty dope. Uh, and the next day, DRX did win. I'm going to say it right now. I did predict it. <laughs> I think yeah. the only one in the, the whole world who predicted it. <laughs> um, I didn't really expect it to go like that, but... Um, Hot damn, dude. They really picked it up after game two. So both days were incredible to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And just to go back to like the the weekend, like and Alistair mentioned, like the the atmosphere, like I might even look up because I think they uh, there's a website. I think it's like um, lot league and theaters or something like that. They were trying to promote something like that where you could find local cinemas that will have these watch parties and I'm, I'm wondering if there's any near me because just the feeling of watching games like in person with a bunch of other fans like that was so hype and I know we were in a huge arena so the the, the energy and the noise like I literally broke my thunder sticks because I was like banging them so hard because it was so awesome. And, you know, just the narratives and the storylines that were all into these games, like T1, the GOAT, right? Like being able to once again make it into the finals after so long and being at such a high level and even his facial reactions, like when he had that crazy zero, then you just kind of see almost his robotic face like break into a little bit of emotion you're like is he crying is he laughing what's happening it looks like he's just you know all the anticipation all the emotion is just uh you know coming out of him and it was exciting to see and then the next day like honestly again drx like having this unbelievable like just underdog story like i keep saying it like i i was like yeah I'll pro- I'm, i might be wrong maybe i'll be wrong and i was wrong and you know what i'm actually happy because this is so exciting now in the finals like to see faker go up against death like honestly i still want faker to win but even if he doesn't like what an amazing this would be the best underdog story ever and like for yeah. death to win that would be like i wouldn't be upset you know like i want to uh, to win but it'd be crazy let's Let's talk about the the, the storylines too, like the yeah. the depth and like the history that these two players bring. Both of these players have been around since the very beginning, almost. Yeah. I think Faker and Death both came around around season three, um, super early on into league, basically when things got like legit. Right, season mm-hmm. two was when things 
it was TPA toy. It was TPA, right? And yep. stuff like that. And toys was like the big player there. But that really was like um, not really like the complete era. Like it really was season three where I feel like this era of League of Legends started. And um, they went to high school together. That's yeah. the craziest thing. Faker and Deft went to the same high school together. And they're only a year apart. I think Faker's 26 and Deft is 27 years old. These guys are old, older players. And Deft has never made it to a finals. This is his first finals ever. So even though they've been playing for the same amount of time, right? Faker's chasing his fourth title and Deft is reaching his first finals ever. And for a team like T1, right? This is like almost expected for a team like DRX. Deft was going to go into military service this year. This was his last two raw. There was no expectations. He gave that interview after he reverse sweeped EDG saying, I never thought we'd make it this far. I never thought we'd make it to Worlds. I never thought we would you know, even beat the uh, EDG. And then now they've taken Gen G, a team that they went 0-8 against in the regular season mm -hmm. all year long, were finally able to take their first game. So yeah, it's pretty amazing storylines how everything added up. Yeah, I even saw on a press conference when they were asking uh, Deft if, you know, him and Faker were friends or, or could be friends or whatever. And it was just cool, like, because he was saying, yeah, we went to high school together or whatever. But in this type of, like, environment like i don't think we could ever be friends like and it wasn't like in a mean way but and i get it like i th there's a tremendous amount of respect obviously from that depth you know has for faker and he, he said that but he's just like look in this type of thing where you're trying to win like it's hard to be friends because like you, you just can't you can't tell you know your friend what you're doing and like how was your day oh it was cool you know we did this in scripts like you can't do that kind of thing yeah. so there's really no way realistically they could be like close friends or whatever but i thought it was interesting that that would happen an interesting side note too is that like in this matchup now right i think i had read that coma recruited a 17 year old faker to play on t1 and look what happened and apparently coma also recruited a 17 year old Zeka to play mm. for uh DRX and so the fact that Zeka and Faker are matching up recruited by the same guy it's pretty interesting and Zeka has been playing his butt off like it's just crazy so again even the deeper storylines and hidden narratives there are are exciting to see uh and yeah, I mean, did you guys have anything else as far as like uh, those, those storylines on either side of those? Because I think there's just so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I was like, yeah, you were talking about how I think it was Faker. You know, he was like smiling and crying like you couldn't really tell. Yeah. Man, if they had the camera on him while DRX was winning, I'm pretty sure he was doing that, but more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, thank God we don't have to play Gen G, our yeah. nemesis who 3 0 us in the finals like a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, uh, that was amazing. I think for like... This was the only way the story could have played out that people would maybe not cheer for Faker. Not because you don't mm. want to cheer for Faker. I mean, yeah. if Faker wins, we all win. But if Def wins, it's like, it's really special. Him and, I'm trying to think throughout history, maybe him and maybe Uzi. Like, those are the only two people I can think of, like, who've been in the scene as long as they have. And just haven't won World Finals. You know, they've done, yep. Def has won MSI once, so has Uzi. And they've won domestically once in a while. But it just never came to anything. And for some people, Worlds is all that matters, right? Which I'd say Def is much better than Bang, even if he doesn't win today. So I'm just happy for him to get to this point. It's it's such a special moment where, like, I think everyone was wrong. Like, every major pundit, everyone coming in. And I think what I got out of it was, like, always trust your eye tests. Like, mm -hmm. uh, throughout all that, yeah, I think Kyoshik was sometimes really bad, sometimes really good. Kingdom was really bad. He was pretty good today, but Zeka almost never looked terrible. And I was like, well, everyone's telling me he's bad if he's not on his characters. But if, you know, if he, everything he's picking is going well, including his Ari, which is not one of his top three characters, I maybe he's playing better than everyone include, that was in the tournament and still is in the tournament uh, yeah. in his role. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy that uh, we've been naysaying since play-ins and here they are. Yeah, I mean Mitchell, good foresight on that to to kind of see DRX uh taking that one. Honestly, it it's almost after game one. I think you had said in Discord, you're like, that's eh, all right. T1 dropped their first game, they'll come back. And yeah. I don't know what it was. I was like, <laughs> why does that feel like that could happen? And then as we were watching game two, I was like, oh my gosh, like I kind of feel it. And that's when I really did feel the energy kind of shift in the arena. And they were doing these cheers in there where 
uh, you know, they would synchronize like the thunderclaps for DRX and it was deafening and it was like, Oh, I was getting chills. Like you, you kind of were just rooting for him. But, um, here's a question, right? Cause Faker is 26. Uh, he's been deferring his military service. Uh, if they win, do you think Faker retires? I, I hate to even mention that because it's the goat, but if he wins, like, so many people would say, yeah, go out on top. Or, like, do you think he has another, you know, year or two to, to try to go for another one? I don't know the nuances of Korean military service. So I know that, like, you can keep deferring up until a certain age. It's usually around the high 20s where a mm -hmm. lot of these pros are going in, like Score was and others. I don't think if it, as long as the military isn't forcing him to go, I'm pretty sure he's just going to keep playing. He's already won three. Two of them were in a row, and he didn't retire then. If you want to go out on top, win three out of four, right? Championships you've been to, and then or three out of four championships out of four years, and just call it a day, right? No one can ever compete with that, uh, at least for a long time. So I think he's just an internal competitor. I don't think he thinks about pretty much anything else except for league. And he's he does a robot. Need, well, he, he's a savant, you know? Like yeah. they're, they're just different from all of us, you know, different yeah. from NA players. Uh, so I think he'll keep playing as long as he doesn't have to serve. And even if he serves, maybe he'll come back. I know that Rush is trying to play, right? Um, now that he's back from military service. I don't know if he'll yep. be good, but it is possible. Yeah. It is only two years. Rush was hard stuck masters in El in Korea. So we'll, well see if he can come back here and get challenger in NA. <laughs> I did know yeah. that. I just didn't want yeah. to say anything. About it. But, I mean, <laughs> Baker has been much better than Rush's peaks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. he he will get GM and be hard stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, X Smithy was hard stuck diamond, so true, true. <laughs> and they big, so you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do I think Faker would retire after winning? No. Um, do I want him to? No. Do I think he should? Maybe just because the whole you know go out on top. I think he definitely has a few extra years, and I think. He definitely could. Like, I mean, he's withstood the test of time. Like, realistically, like the it's almost ten years. He won his first world title nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. that's that's and that's a long he's time. in finals for his next one. <laughs> almost every year he's gone, he's made it to at least semifinals. Like, clearly the guy is insane. And honestly, I don't want him to. Do I think he should? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Mm. Yeah, I I think that. Um, this may be a little controversial, so I'll say it with a grain of salt, but the Korean military service is a bit of an antiquated system. Like, I, it's going to take these people out of their lives, and you have to lose all of your money and resources and income, and then you just have to start over over the military. It's been around for a really long time, and the necessity of it has kind of disappeared at this time. I mean, we have BTS, we have yeah. K-pop. Are they going to go into Korean military service? Because if they do, Korea is clearly saying we would rather support this antiquated system than make a shitload of money. Well, they, so, they are actually because not that I follow BTS closely, but my yeah. my I I'm not gonna lie, my my, my family does uh, follow BTS, and they are mm -hmm. kind of taking a sabbatical because they they have to do their uh, military service because they're all a, a little older or about the same age as Faker. So yeah, they, but they until actually they actually go, yeah. go in, I'm not going to say that they're going in because mm. until they literally are in it, yeah, people are just talking. We're just saying words, right? Because if <laughs> yeah. I'm the Korean government, why the hell would I send BTS or Faker <laughs> yeah. or some of these top pros into Korean military service so they lose a year of just everything, their entire economy? Like this, South Korea has completely blossomed and taken over the world in terms of their culture. Yep. So I don't think that he should go into Korean military service. I don't think any pro player should go into Korean military service. And I know that it exists as a system to help the country and to help the individual, but these individuals clearly don't need help. They're actually so valuable as people. Um, so that's my thought on it. I don't, I don't want to retire ever. I think you should just keep going and going and going because he's only 26 years old. Like if you watch the co stream, everybody's memeing like, Oh, that's a 19 year old play. Like Medios is making this joke over and over again. Right. And it's like, Dude, 26, 30, 35, right? There's been many research. There's a lot, a multitude of research in sports psychology and reflexes that your reflexes don't actually die down until much later on in your life. It's maybe physical. So for physical sports, I can see a reason why some people might want to retire. But in terms of video games and reaction timing and learning, 
age does not play a factor until much later into your life. Um, so I don't think you should retire. Yeah. Yeah. I to add on to I agree. I think like I get the I do see like the value of like, oh, you know, everyone's the same, you know, we're all equal, no one's getting like extra favorable treatment. But it there's like comes a certain point where like it's just not beneficial for your culture. Like you have these BTS is like I think they have some of the top ten singles in the world, mm -hmm. stream singles singles on Spotify. I think it's like four or five of theirs are just up there and the other K pop stars. And I'm like, are you really gaining anything culturally by sending them into mandatory service for two years? Like when Boxer, who's a legend in StarCraft, went into Korean military service, like he was such a big deal. They literally made a StarCraft team out of like pros who were forced to go to the military called Air <laughs> Force Ace. Wow. And so they okay, just they wow. competed in pro league while doing their military service. Maybe uh. they'll make Faker a team who can compete in LCK. I don't know, but <laughs> It was so sick. I was like, wow, there's just literally a team while they're in their military service. It was also yeah. shorter back then. It was like a year and a half or something like that. So I, I, I'm, we don't know the geopolitical stuff about it, but like, I don't think it's that hard to say BTS shouldn't have to go to military service. And right. I don't think Faker does either. Faker is universally known. He is probably the most famous esports star, period, in yep. any esport. I'm trying to think of anyone in any other singular game that's as famous, and I can't think of one. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I think you're right. Like, and I, again, I'm not going to try to speculate, but it does seem like at some point there should be an exception threshold. Like when you're making billions of dollars for your country, like I think, <laughs> I think that's good enough reason to be like, you're exempt. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're okay. Because yeah, it's like, what's I, the point of the military, right? It's right. To help your country. Exactly. So I yeah. think they're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doing a good job. All right. Uh, should we break down the series T1 versus JDG and kind of go through the stuff? Cause Sorry, already I forgot. Yeah, go One ahead. last storyline. This is okay. actually uh, Barrel's third straight finals in a oh, row. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. We are hyping up DRX and how you're well right. they're playing. We did forgot to mention Barrel. Third straight finals in a row, twice on Danwon Gaming, once on DRX. He actually gets to watch Danwon Gaming lose to the team he beats. Mm, barrel diff. Amazing. Actually, Barrel diff. Yeah. So, and yeah, he yeah. played All well, right. too. And we'll get to that when we well. break that down. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was just like amazed at his play so for sure let's vi revisit him again but t1 and jdg uh even in the games i mean the fact that we see rise on fake or like couldn't get any better come on like that's just so awesome to see but uh overall thoughts on the games we could just start with game one or any anything get you know picked bands drafts any of your thoughts there uh kevin you kind of yeah. take the lead on that Simple thoughts. Game one, JG looked good. They look like what we expected coming into it. Kind of expected to see that throughout the rest of the series. I will say that Hope was still was the weak point, and that kind of carried on throughout the whole series. They had the Ophelis Lulu pick, which I still think is better than Lucian Nami, if equal players. But we saw a lot of key moments in the set. Once one part came to mind where they were fighting top lane, they were starting to win. They got a catch onto Faker, and uh, Faker's rise in game two. And then Hope just game like walked. Yeah. Oh, sorry, game three. And Faker's uh, Hope starts to walk in as Aphelios onto the Lucian, and Guma just bursts him. And then Guma starts to carry the fight, right? If they just wait for their teammates to converge and kill the AD carry there, they can get Baron. But Hope just continues to make bad plays over and over, even though he was pretty clutch late game, which is where I was expecting him to be clutch. Uh, so he fell off in this series in general. Faker's rise was magical. Honestly, like, I, I watched those games, and I was like, we how does he just keep finding these angles? How does mm -hmm. he like, he knows the rotations. Everyone's on the same page. He knows how to team fight. He knows how to, to play for the team farm, everything. So his rise is, he's just gonna like the rise rework should just be renamed to faker or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. At this point, he's the sole reason that rise one tricks can't play their character. in so mm -hmm. cute because it just keeps getting nerfed. I mean, we'll talk about it later about other rise players, but yeah, faker was insane. And then Guma, gets a lot of credit he was yeah. incredible in the series i think that he showed a he, just a bot div him and carry obviously but guma like specifically raised his level so much more on average than even the previous series where he was playing well uh i do think zeus and 369 was a close matchup at times i honestly mm -hmm. thought both showed times of hyper carrying i think 369 had less hyper carry percentage so it was like 40 percent of the times zeus was worse or 369 was better but that also could just be a factor of just your team being worse um, in that series. So that's all I had for that. I think that Kanavi was an incredible uh, in some of those games. And I was like, wow, he's really good at jungling. But there wasn't enough power around it, um, especially the bot lane, to like facilitate the plays he wanted to make. Yeah. 
Yeah, the the bot diff was pretty pretty big issue. I mean, I, I don't know why you keep giving over Lucian Nami. It's mm -hmm. just like, sure, Aphelios Lulu scales better, and like it can be better with coordinated play, but it's like Lucian Nami just gives so much control over the mid game and laning phase. We need to rework Lucian. I, I'm I'm just gonna say it. The the way he's played is so toxic. It's not fun for the game. But it's anyways, fun to watch. Like, Sometimes. <laughs> Honestly, no. It's it's you don't lost. think so? It's it's, think it's, it's lost its appeal to it. me. No, I like, like watching it. I think it's, it's like, fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> one tap I mean, people. Yeah, things are fun to play. You can just one shot. But it's like, yeah. at least like for me personally, like I'm, I was enjoying watching Lucian again, but now it's just it's so stale because he like you're not even building CDR on him. You're just playing to one shot. Like there there is not like mm. the level of mechanics required to play the champion has dropped so far. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. it's like, oh yeah, we're just going to I'm just going to have this Nami buff me up. Half of my damage is Nami's and I'm going to take first strike because that also uh, ups Nami's damage. Mm. And I'm just going to 100 to 0 with my ultimate from a screen away and slow, and with my movement speed Nami slow. Like it's it, it really has lost its appeal and I just don't know why it's still allowed to exist. That rant out of the way. Um, Guma played it really well. Um, and even the game he played Varus, I still don't think the, Var the Varus is that good. He made the champ look really strong. And mm. I think, to be fair, I think JDG was kind of tilted at that point. Yeah, they um, were. <laughs> just just a bit. But mm -hmm. I mean, he he made the champ look broken. Um, at the same time, I feel bad for Kanavi, like I already mentioned. I think he played really well. I think he was definitely the better jungler. But I think his I think he played better than owner overall, but I think the uh, bot and which caused like support roam timers just to be off just made it so hard for him to play and he couldn't carry as hard as he wanted to or needed to. Yeah, I think um, I'll start with the jungle matchup then. Um, the I This is more of a reflective of last week's series between uh, Canyon and Peanut, where one side is the carry jungler and one side is the defensive jungler owner was the defensive jungler right he played poppy he was playing okay nocturne is a bit more of a carry jungler right but you're really relying on your team for setup and then viego in the last game okay so it was i guess the style was not as like far different compared to canyon and peanut but you could tell right the the team is playing much more heavily around um kanavi to be the carry picking belveth uh mm -hmm. versus Owner is really there for his team, and the carries is uh, Faker and Guma, right? So I think it can look like a jungle diff, but that's just how it goes, right? You just take what you get as the jungler when you're in a position where you're sacking for your team. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a jungle diff in my opinion. I think that Owner and Peanut and stuff like that that are playing for their team is just the better way to play right now. Clearly, both of them won their series uh, playing the supportive style. Uh, obviously, Peanut didn't win his next one. But anyways, mm -hmm. I don't think jungle carry is as strong as it is. It's just not enough resources and income and gold in the role. Or, and or, there's not enough of a broken champion in the role to make it worthwhile giving gold. So the Belveth, I mean, is a strong champion, right? But like, she has to snowball so hard and so fast to actually carry a game. I just think jungle carry is not the meta right now. And... We'll see, right? Because we have uh, we have uh, Piosik, who did actually play a pretty heavy jungle style and ended up beating DRX with it. Um, so it's not like a given. You can just play... You can play any style of jungle. Uh, I just feel like it's easier to do the more supportive style. Um, I'm going to go into, I guess, a bit of JDG's play. And that I was actually fairly disappointed in some of their instances. Um, it's just mechanical things, right? So there's like forced errors so a team puts you into a tough decision and you have to make a choice and it's really hard to tell in the moment you can make a mistake you can make the right play and you can react good or bad right there's other times where it's like you just get outplayed mechanically or in a team fight or a situation and yeah that's tough you go back and you see these little things you can do and fix up right jdg made a lot of unforced errors they made a lot of things that were mistakes simply based on their own execution not super related to what T1 was doing, and it caused them to lose a lot of momentum and leads. When you're playing against Rise, tempo and side lane pressure is king. So if you make these little mistakes and you have, let's say, a Rise 1v1 a Renekton, and the Rise lives with 5 HP, and you look back at that fight and you realize, um, 
three six nine, he could have auto W'd and he would have killed Faker, but he didn't. He started off his combo as Renekton with just Wing, no yeah. auto reset. That was the difference between that play, right? He dies. Um, Aphelios and Lulu, they waste a ton of time going up top lane looking for Rise. Obviously, he makes the crazy play, the Fog of War to Realm Warp to, to escape. But that caused so much of a tempo loss for the JDG that that stuff really adds up. You have another situation where um, Kanavi, he's trying to dive Gangplank in Game 3. And Gangplank barely lives, right? But if he gets the dive off, Gangplank loses an entire wave. The game is totally different after that, right? You have JDG, you have you have 369 once again, dashing forward and Renekton. He gets baited by Lucian because he dashes forward. And then he just gale forces backwards. And all of a sudden, Renekton just dies in mid lane for free red before Dragon. It's all these little things that are unforced errors on the side of JDG that I felt like it was a bummer, like rewatching the series and, and noticing all these things because they were such a clean team for so long. Um, but all five of their players had these weird... Weird little things. I mean, yeah, Gao was just honestly a non-factor in this series as well. Like, mm -hmm. he would just... His Silas, <laughs> so many times, he would get out with 1 HP, and he just says, YOLO, I'm going back in, and he does not a whole lot and just gives a free kill. I think he did that twice uh, on the Silas. Um, he messed up his timing on a Zier wall and a Zonia's. A Zier wall, a Zonia's target, does it too early, gets no value off of it. It's just all these really silly things added up to... Well, T1 taking it pretty handedly in the 3-1 series. And um, I just felt like it needed to be called out. Yeah. And, you know, this is where I don't know, is it nerves on the stage, right? I mean, not that it doesn't have, like, T1 has nerves too, right? But yeah. we talked about this where, you know, their previous matchups, like JDG basically got the, you know, raffle stomp rogue, right? And T1, although it was against RNG and they, you know, it was a 3-0 as well, it was much closer, right? And there were times where they were tested. And um, I think at some points, yeah, it's unforced errors, but also maybe it's like just miscalculations or misplays, thinking like, oh, I got him. I, this is a good call. And I, I go in and realize like, oh, wait, he had Gale Force or something like that, right? And so in those moments of the stage, the energy, the, you know, the, the nervousness, everything that's at stake – those decisions are super important. Like you said, like that one V one, like that was just crazy. I mean, Faker went in there, like he had way more HP than, uh, you know, uh, than he did than Faker and he still lost that. And so he's probably thinking like, I, I should easily get this one misplay is the big difference there. And they lose a bunch of tempo. I will say that, um, you know, when you're looking at the game plans, if they're, they're trying to play through Kanavi, like, it just wasn't there. But if you look at the other side of Faker and Gumi Yusi with their carries, like, Gumi Yusi had 916 DPM compared to yeah, Hope's really 550. Insane. And then Faker, 619 DPM. Uh, you know, the, the highest DPM on, on uh, JDG was 369 with 556. So if their game plan, which by their drafts looked like Funnel Kanavi, he only had 344 DPM. It wasn't working. And so their, their yeah. game plans were just not to the style that they wanted to do. And I think you might be right. Like, I don't think jungle carry meta is just the thing. And uh, maybe they try to force it a little too hard. I will say I was a little nervous um, that they picked Lucian Nami again in game two, T1 did, uh, because, you know, even though the lane was fine, like uh, I was just scared they were going to run it back against Aphelios Lulu again, especially because I thought in game one, I figured T1 had the tools to to take out Aphelios. I mean, you have Camille Gallio, right? Mm -hmm. Vi. Like, Aphelios shouldn't be able to play that he game. He wasn't, to be fair. That's yeah, true. That's, that's the funny part about that comp is yeah. uh, they picked Camille Gallio, this super hardcore mm -hmm. dive comp, right? It's not Neither of their champions are super OP right now. Camille's yeah. strong. Gallio is kind of whatever. And it's just a very straightforward easy comp yeah you mm -hmm. kill the ad carry but then you have Jax and and viego yeah. and you realize you don't care about the affiliates that much right like everybody when you have teams where everybody's a threat you can't play these like one shot combos like it's just not good enough um yeah. t1 needed to draft more skirmishers to to match the enemy skirmishers or have 5v5 team fighting to outscale them like but doing this sort of like dive the backline type of comp against you know, fighters and, and one ADC, yeah. one 
scary. It just doesn't really work. And then, I mean, that was just a bad draft by T1. Absolute garbage, but whatever. Yeah, Faker it was. Later. But I will say, even, <laughs> even in that game one, though, like, I thought Faker's Galio still looked pretty sick at some moment. Oh, they were like, still yeah. outplaying them with the worst Oh, draft. my gosh. Yeah. They still, still were like outplaying it. them. It was Zeus that was really choking it, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is yeah. one of those games, especially with Faker, where you're like, eh, it doesn't matter the draft. They're just going to try to outplay you in every, every yeah. second and try to just outskill you. Um, so explain this to me then, because I don't know. Uh, game two, Yone and JDG picks Malphite. Um, oh, God. Because, okay, yeah. <laughs> my thought process is that, like, why, if if it's a counter, then okay. But still, at the same time, like, it's 369. Like, don't, don't, I don't know if, like, that's who I want him to be on, honestly. Um, so it, it, am I missing yeah. something here? What am I missing? Like, le- is that just bad or did I not see something? No, mi- missing is missing from the series. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there? I mean, I mean is there? Ball in the series, it's just hope missing. Mm, okay. Yep. Hope missing. <laughs> I, I mean, the way I saw it was like they they wanted to just play weak side top for some reason, mm. even though their best player on average is either Kanavi or three six nine, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. They they saw that even though they had a huge draft gap in game one, they were still having trouble closing. So they're like, okay. We need to make sure our AD carry doesn't struggle, and then we should be able to be fine whatever way, right? Because, frankly, T1's drafts were kind of weird in a lot of games, in my mind, because I don't think Rise is good, but it was just played so well that, you know, okay, fine, it's good when Faker's playing, yeah. but on paper, I don't think it's wrong to try to, you know, supplement your boss as long as they're reliable when they get to late game. And, historically, whenever they get to late game, Hope is good. He's, like, actually really good. He's, mm-hmm. His server was insane in uh, group stage. I just think that he choked. I think he played incredibly poorly, even with resources, even when he got the late game with three items. Like you would saw you would see consistently JDG would like sack objectives, sack whatever, just so that they could get the three of Ophelia's. And then when it hit three item with the IE, you wouldn't notice it. Mm. He would just get caught out, or he wouldn't do any DPS or misposition or misses all. He did have some proactive like Gale first forward in uh Ophelia's combos, but he would just miss them or like pulled the trigger at the wrong time right it was it just felt like he was out of his element and they couldn't play toward him but they were too scared or didn't trust him to play weak side bot lane while they played toward a carry top and so they were just left without any good tools gotcha okay uh any final thoughts on this series before we move on to the other one I mean, the Malphite, we've seen this, we saw this in LCS finals. We actually saw Someday play Malphite top lane into, I think, somebody, it was like Aatrox or something, and then we we made this comment, like, and both Alistair and I chimed in, League of Legends is, players are too good to lose to Malphite, right? He's so easy to play around, he's so easy to play against, right? If you miss, if he misses his ulti, that champion is worthless. And guess what? You saw multiple times Gumiyushi dash out of it, carry a flash out of it, Faker Zonia's the Malphite ulti, right? Those tools are so easy to execute for these players, and then you have a whole champion afterwards. Malphite without an ultimate is not a champion. Mm-hmm. So you burned a flash, and you have a you still have a fully functioning Lucian and a fully functioning Nami and Rise. So I do think the Malphite is completely just scrim bait or something. They probably stomped a team fight. They got a couple good ultis off, and they thought it was good. They thought it would be fine to Yone, right? Can stabilize the laning phase or something. But it's it's not real anymore. We're at a different time of League of Legends. Players are too fast. Players' hearts are beating way too quickly, and you're on zero ping. So Malphite, I don't think, has a place in pro play anymore. Mm. It's like... You have to be able to catch people yeah. without flashes and without dashes and get a two to three man ulti to actually have value off of it. Like, it's just not, it's too risky. Um, so that, that that's my take Players on, are too the, good. Uh, on the Malphite. Players are too good. Mm-hmm. And then I think when you look at the overall comp as well, it's like Kanavi kept trying to play Belveth into like Lucian Nami and like you really can't get onto Lucian ever as Belveth. It's actually so hard. The one time they like it felt like like they could like Belveth was doing stuff. It's like it's when Gumiyushi is actually getting caught or trolling. Like otherwise, I don't know how you ever get on top of Illusion as Belveth. So same with Rise to an extent too, right? Like he just clicks you and runs away. So it's the Belveth pick really felt like it was cocky. It was way overconfident. It was they needed if they wanted Malphite, they should have picked a team fighting comp. But they had no faith in their AD carry, so Konavi was like, I'm going to play a carry. But it's like, I don't know, just play Viego or something, or play, like, Wukong, or, I don't know, it's nerfed, but 
play something that's not Belveth there. So, yeah, yeah unfortunate. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. Let's move on to the Gen G DRX series. Uh, another banger of a series. Uh, it's funny because, you know, we saw a bunch of Lucian Nami and my son's favorite champion right now is Lucian. And mm, he was yeah. banned every game. And so he's like, why do they keep banning Lucian? And I was like, <laughs> ah, they figured it out, son. I was like, he's too good. And then the fact that Heimer is getting banned every time in first rotation. It's like, wow, what a world. What what is a what a what a world we live in. But um yep. anyways, what are your thoughts on uh this series uh overall? And you can break into any of the games if you want. Yeah, so my thoughts on this series, wow, there's a lot of thoughts. <laughs> my macro thought, which I think will headline my other thoughts, is that in less than a month in NA. Chovy and crew just look pretty bad. I think <laughs> just had bad practice. Let's go! This might have affected a lot of teams. Not just we did it, Deft! Like, we did it! <laughs> it! It might just be a question of, like, they could not get good practice or good meta reads or just whatever they needed to sharpen their skills because they could only scrim a very limited number of teams in their own group. Champs Q is, like, once more and more teams drop out, Champs Q's quality drops really quickly. Uh, solo Q, don't even think about it. And so it's like, what are they going to do, right? And in my mind, like, I thought Chovy played awfully. I, I, oh, thought, yes. I thought that this man actually played quite above, like, all the memes throughout a lot of the tournament. But some parts of the Darwin series, and this series especially, the meme just came alive, man. Like, I was I was eating good. I was like, holy shit, he's just, he just TP'd bot to just push a wave. Or, like, this man just has to get to the wave. And oftentimes, sometimes it is correct. But oftentimes it was just like, what are you doing? Like, um, there was one fight where Zeka pops off on Kali, kills three of them, right? And Chovy was just pushing mid as his team is getting destroyed. And I was just like, come on, man. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, this might just be his legacy for a long time. Even Oof. if he does win eventually, yeah. like, I think for a long time, people are just going to associate with him. Like, he cannot be trusted when it all matters, um, even though he is world class, right? His lane is world class. I don't think anyone's ever said he's the number one team fighter in the world or anything, but he was always at least serviceable, right? Once you get enough fleet, you should be serviceable. He was not serviceable in this series. Not at all. Gen G in general looked out class. I actually think Pioshik played carry junglers really well. And so that's why I'm, did, a, yep. I'm I'm pushing back a little bit because they beat the tournament number one uh, at this well, point. Well, I think so, yes. My pushback in that in the very quick way was that it felt like Peanut was trying to respond with his own carry style and it did not fit. Like his graves was very underwhelming. And I, yeah, that's, I think Peanut just didn't, he tried to play that style against him and didn't mm -hmm. seem like it worked in that one instance. He played Viego game four as well. So, that, and the game that, three was just a complete stop. Yeah. That Graves pick was so confusing to me. How are you, how are you just going to blind pick Graves against Pioshik? Yeah. He's known for being a Kindred player. Yeah. And, and you're yeah. going to blind Graves pick is it? not good either. It's not like a Graves carry. He's not like the one of the best Graves in the world or anything. So like D the yeah. DRX draft gap in game two is insane. They had un like pretty much unpunishable top because like you can't punish Gragas really. You have hard winning matchup for Kindred, a pushing skirmishing mid, and a hard pushing skirmishing bot lane. Like Kindred just gets to eat good. Like they almost lost that game too, though. They, that they bot lane did. start was one of the most troll things ever. I mean yeah. that's that's the that's the main thing and why I don't think like the Kate Lux is that good. You just force vertical because if you're playing the jungler, you can't start bot side. Right? You have to start topside because you can't path away from the Kate Lux. Yeah. So yeah. the enemy jungler just kind of vertical jungles and cuts off the lane for a bit. Yeah, and they and they know exactly what you're doing when you have Kate Lux and stuff. Yeah, my, I guess my only thing, my initial reaction was I didn't actually like DRX's draft in game two. And that was mostly because of the mid pick. Uh, Ari is heavily nerfed compared to Silas. And it's always been traditionally a very good lane for Silas as well. Um, it's not too difficult to dodge any of her abilities. You can get through fine. The harass isn't too terrible. And once you do hit level six, right, you do see, you saw it once and then Zeka actually lived, but Silas has a, a like complete like onus to just jump on the Ari whenever because he's just a better Ari with her ulti. Um, but you actually did see at 15 minutes, Zeka was up 30 CS and four plates in like isolation. I think that was the stat. If it's not those exact numbers, it's somewhere around there. In an isolation matchup, Chovy lost lane by 30 CS and three to four plates at 15 minutes. Yeah, so regardless of the losing matchup for Ari in that situation, who's a very nerfed champion, Zeka just outplayed the crap out of, out of, out of Chovy in lane. So when you have that going for you and you have a winning bot lane, right? And you have, you know, a winning jungle matchup. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty, 
that's pretty like that's pretty intense like that's i don't know man chovy was quite disappointing i think that also that play where he accidentally um ease and chains onto the gragas oh, yeah <laughs> when it doesn't look like he wanted to I was like, he doesn't what? press flash he doesn't press zonius he presses none of his buttons he just dies and i thought oh that's it that's so that's it chovy is choking and they're going to lose this game, and they might even lose the series. Because you saw in Game 3, it was a complete stomp. DRX completely destroyed them in Game 3. Uh, and it wasn't until Game 4 that Chobi kind of started coming back, right? But then you, then you go then to Game 4, oh. he, he sees, he's trying to take Gromp or something. He sees the enemy, he flashes and yeah. rise ulties. There's nobody there at all. Like... I mean, oh my they god! Were off map. I think he was scared of the Gragas, but it, it did look bad. Yeah, it looked okay, so that's bad. What the apologists are saying about that play. Oh yeah, <laughs> there was no vision except for one or two people. So he maybe there was a Brom or Gragas or well, whatever. <laughs> it, it doesn't fucking matter. Why is he there taking Gromp in the first I, place? I, that's I don't the disagree. worst play you could have made, yeah. right? Like yeah. if you have the awareness to know, hey, I have no vision of anyone. I could get flashed on. Why? First place. So he just made a goober tier play. He looked like. Worse than an NA pro. Even NA pros very rarely do shit like that. No, they just that, die there. Yeah, they were just yeah, die they there. just die. Yeah. That's true. Chovy, That's true. Chovy burns everything and doesn't lives. I mean, I guess it's it's funny, and I think I would take the alternative of him just dying there. But still, it's like there was literally no one there and almost no threat on him at all. Yeah. So it's it's just unfortunate for him. He had a really rough series. I mean, His I, I, looked I so much worse than Fakers, man. It, it he was did. one night and day. And it's also a team thing too, right? Because maybe Chovy doesn't have as strong as a voice, so he can't tell everybody to go places, right? Do you remember Faker and Owner? They or no Faker and uh, Zeus? They TP to the same location on top side and then Rise Realm into the Baron pit to start the Baron early, mm -hmm, yeah. and then Poppy yeets the Malphite away. That's just a perfect play. That's planned two minutes in advance with wave states and TP timings. Like that's crazy. That's mm -hmm. Faker. I bet you calling that stuff like. Someone had to make that call and being like, hey, we can make this distance and timing. I know exactly. Where's Chovy saying those words, right? I remember Chovy watching him in LCK, making the big ass plays, flashing in a Silas, getting a four man gnarlty into a Neverfrost. Like, Chovy didn't show up this series. And he had to because he's playing against, like, basically a rookie, like a, what, a 17, 18 year old kid, Zeka, mm -hmm. who's never really made it to Worlds ever, played in LPL just a little bit. I mean, it was not supposed to be an outclassing like that, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, man. I couldn't believe in Chovy, and, and that's why I, I, I predicted the way I did. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I think worst case is he also lost in lane at least three out of the four games, I would say, and that's yeah. like the one thing you're like, if you sign Summit, right? You sign Chovy, you want one thing out of them, right? They need to be able to lane, if not being chain ganked, right? He wasn't being chain gank. He was just getting outclassed in a lot of those yeah. games, and also less lane pressure, or sorry, less map pressure. It was honestly just one of his worst series I've ever seen him play, including the times when he was on shittier teams, right? Yeah, um, and wasn't doing well. It was, I think it was Hamwa when he wasn't also doing well. So I think like he, this is going to hurt him for a long, a long time. This is going to hurt his career for a long time because he dominated domestically for the split before they won the split. But now you have even more naysaying where you can just say, well, you know, when it really matters, he just completely choked. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing, too. Like, oh, man, you don't want to be known as that perennial player who is good in regular season. Uh, and to be fair, they win domestic championships. But, you know, everybody looks at Worlds as like the thing. And so you yeah. don't want to be known as the perennial like, oh, yeah, I can win in my region, but I just can't show up, you know, uh, on the world <laughs> stage. Well, yes, but at, Korea always has a chance. NA doesn't really have like a chance. I mean, if we you're make talking out of about a, winning a re winning their region and not yeah, yeah. Hey, Look, if we take those EU as well. But. If NA makes it out of groups, I'm happy. Okay, it, it <laughs> I'm not sure. even referring. Our bar is to, lower. Yeah, our yes. bar is way. If we way go lower. four and fifteen next year with a bunch of NA boomers or whatever, or no NA amateurs with no boomers, I'll be happy. We did better than the Heck year yeah. before. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think Genji, I mean, okay, so Ruler probably, like, I think is pretty clearly played the best out of all of Genji um, on their match. But even him, right, I looked to game three, and I remember he gets ulti would 
by a collie, and Ruler has flash up, and he doesn't do anything. He doesn't dodge the the E, and then he gets auto targeted, right? And then he's just dead. Like once you get hit E by E by a collie, you're you're probably dead. And he doesn't flash it. He should know. I'm Ezreal. I have two flashes. I need to not die to a collie like this. I don't know. He just walks into range of a Kali R and gets E'd, and then Zeka gets a triple care, and then DRX gets Baron. I really felt like Ruler could have still played it better. It just, it did feel like Genji was just not pressing their buttons that much. Um, I also think that um, what was it? it was like the craziest tank one v one. I think it was Orin versus Sejuani in topside. You see, um, you see uh, Kingen flash the Sejuani ulti by a small margin and get the solo kill on. On and was like, oh wait. This is hype. I know yeah. it's just a tank noodle fight, but that was pretty hype. That was sick looking. So it's just feels like everybody on DRX played how they're supposed to and really did what they're supposed to do. And Genji did collapse. Yeah, it wasn't like one team played way better and the other team was just, you know, better than them. It was like Genji fell down a level a bit. And um, that is disappointing to hear. And if I'm being honest, Def didn't even play that well, actually. Def was actually just the one getting caught and baiting everybody uh, to go into his team. Barrel had an insane Renata game. Holy yeah. cow. That champ is not balanced at all. Like, I thought, like, I understood why uh, Genji picked, uh, you know, an Enchanter support. Because, like, I don't want to... You don't want to be a melee champ against uh, against Barrel, right? But, like, against uh, Renata. But, like, his ultis were so insane. Same with Karia the day before. Their, their ulties are just, like, have the craziest angles. When I play Renata, I never can hit my ulti because people just run away from it. But they're just they're just getting, like, four mans constantly. So really insane stuff from GRX. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I, I will say one last rant. Why is Doran still on top teams? Mm, <laughs> yeah. That was a bummer. I, I'm not impressed by him. Like, he's not terrible, but, like, he he's finding himself on these, like, legendary elite rosters right genji is supposed to be this monster roster griffin back in the i'm just like he even as a weak side top lane he's just not that good <laughs> i don't yeah. get it i really don't get how he keeps finding these spots maybe he's a shot caller maybe i don't know he had an okay uh game score wise on red Actin, but then he just like did not do anything with it it was like i think he might have been 303 at some point or maybe, was that mm. jdg i forget who it was but it, I don't know. I'm not happy with Doran's performance at all. Kingen, I don't think, is a monster top laner, but he looked way better in most of the games here, even when they weren't winning. So I don't get it. Yeah. I don't know what's up with him. Yeah, I do want to say that Zekka, I mean, just one more shout out to him. Uh, really amazing. I mean, his Akali game was just, oof. It was, uh, I, I can't tell you how many oohs and ahs there was in the stadium when, uh, you know, he was making all these plays. And it's funny because that game, uh, I had an, uh, there was an Akali main beside me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was, every time, like, Zeko would make a play, I'm like, your champ is just not fair, man. <laughs> I was like, your champ is just not fair. He's like, I know. And it's with Zeko, so it's like, it even, makes it even more unfair. And I was like, yeah, uh, I know. But um, any final thoughts on this before we make our predictions? Because there's only one more matchup uh, to go. Yeah. So uh, should we just go to that predictions? Yeah. I, I have some interesting things just to, like, think about is that, like, I don't know, what, it, how, I guess, does this kind of happen? Like, mm -hmm. why does DRX sort of just get so good? Is it meta? Like, I think it is a bit of meta, right? You take, Barrel has a bit more flexibility not playing Yumi or Lulu every game. Mm -hmm. And then Deft isn't stuck on Sivir Yumi every game. And I guess when the power level of bot lane goes down a bit, the rest of the power level, relatively speaking, goes up. Good point. Is it the Kindred pick, right? Like... It did feel like Pioshik, especially in game four, was just taking over completely. And it wasn't until Genji figured out we need to one shot the Kindred before she can ulti that start, fight started to be, look more even, right? But as soon as DRX adjusted and Pioshik just didn't play as aggressively, so he couldn't get flash stunned, mm -hmm. DRX is just such a free win. And it's like, you have, like, how does this come about? Like, DRX was 0 and 8 versus Genji before this series happened. So. I think it's crazy. And to me, the most impressive game by Zeka was actually this the uh, the Ari game. The Ari game where he completely lane gapped Shovi, and then he made the clutch plays by hiding in fog and getting um, the charm onto Ruler. Ruler had to cleanse and flash away, and then Zeka gets another charm on him, a flash charm on him. Like Zeka carried game two so hard, 
And that momentum changed the directory of the entire series because they stomped game three against Gen.G. And then game four, while it was close, it didn't feel like DRX was ever actually going to lose. So I personally credit Zekka so much for that clutchness in game two, getting that kill on Sub Ruler um, and the pick uh, in that dragon fight. Um, yeah, it's just... Yeah. Zekka is just... I don't know. I uh, I said he was having the best mid lane performance last week, too. And if he can take down Faker, he's going to be legendary. Like, oh my this gosh. kid is actually going to go straight to legend. I, he already kind of is at straight at legendary status. But like, this is this is like a like a new generation just really being shown from yeah. LCK right now. So I I'm all for Zeka. I love it. What That's exciting too because line, yeah. if you know, you especially talking about like these other goats like of you know Faker and Deft and you know these older guards and even like Chovy to some extent and all these names that have been there for a while. You know, you're you are kind of wondering. When is what is the new ge generation going to look like? Because imagine when Faker does eventually leave, like who's going to be the, the the guy or the team that's like, you I'll know, carrying you, it. They already have someone lined up. Ju just that? their their infrastructure. They already have someone lined up. Well, yeah, I Do know that, but or... I'm talking about like as far as just. I mean, there. I, I. It's very hard for me to imagine there being anyone close to Faker. Like as far as longevity, as far as it's like, you know, you talked about could he still stay in. No one else could, I don't think, but Faker could because he is like, I think your word was better than mine, Kevin. You said he's like a savant. He really is like he is like he could play league and stay at a top level because uh, his work ethic, his his ability to keep on learning at this age is still impressive. And it's difficult because if it wasn't, you would see a lot more older players playing at a high level, but they can't. And it, and it really, like you said, doesn't have to do with mechanics it has to do with your mental and being able to keep up with the grind and keep up with the meta and still be able to be top tier on champs like rise when it's not, not, not good anymore. And 40% win rate, 40% right, win rate and still <laughs> be able to, you know, make these decisions. And, you know, there's just so many layers to it that, yeah. I that's what I mean by us like I can't wait for the next one and hopefully you know maybe years down the road maybe it's Zeka maybe it's these other maybe new players Zekka. right you know yep. like that's maybe exciting to see old versus new and you know old generation new generation what what happens and speaking of that let's get to predictions because we have DRX now versus T1 man you know normally this would just be easy for me because you guys know what I would say and uh, I'm still thinking, but I probably will say the same thing. Uh, but still, it makes it a lot harder now that DRX has proven me wrong every freaking time. So I'm going to go last. Thanks, Kevin, <laughs> for starting yeah. us off. <laughs> yeah, so if I want DRX to win, the thing to do is to vote for T1. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to do either way. Um, yeah. uh, it's The story is there. It's a really good story and everything. But at the end of the day, like DRX... Like the opponents they were beating did not look like they were at their like highest level, right? Unless you want to argue EDG is the second best team at the tournament because they three two and Genji was you know three one, but I don't think we anyone's taking that argument. So I think there's a lot of power on DRX right now. They have a lot of momentum, but like Faker ain't no Chobi. Like this is not the same yeah. matchup. It's not going to be free. He's not going to get free roams. They're going to be matched. Faker's rise is disgusting. Like, there's so many different tools to handle what Zeka brings to the table. And, like, I I just don't see this matchup going the way they want it, especially because they don't have Doran in the top lane either to place against. Kingan's going to be a problem, um, not in a good way. So <laughs> I, I think it's going to be 3-1. I think that, yeah, DRX will still probably win one. They might get some Kindred draft to work, and they'll get some Pryo because Ruler is playing – or not Ruler. Um, Def is playing well enough. Ruler was playing out of his mind. Uh but I think I want T1 to win. I want Faker to win. But, you know, we live in a really happy world where this time, no matter who wins, it's fine. Yeah. Like, it's it's a happy ending. I think, like, this was the year where if JDG had one, it's not as exciting, even though it's LPL versus LCK, because we've got an LPL versus LCK, like, I guess only once in World Finals, but we've twice in World Finals. We've only gotten a few, few times, but this year, the other narratives are just more important. I don't think that DRX's matchup is very good into T1. And I think that if Don1 had somehow made it all the way to, like, semis, that I think DRX would have had a happy time. Um, but the finals matchup, I don't think either JDG or T1 was good. I always said that the top side would be the winner. So, T1. Yeah. 
Sorry, Duft. <laughs> Rip. <laughs> I'm torn because years ago when I actually followed LCK, DRX was the team I always cheered for. Specifically Pioshik. I don't know why it was something about him. I, <laughs> I just I, I'm just a Pioshik fan. But at the, yeah. <laughs> you did do the dance. But yeah. Honestly, it took me a few like, minutes. I was like, what is that? Yeah, the dance. I, I don't know, man. I just I don't think they're gonna do it. And I really want them to. But I think Actually, I was going to say, I think it's going to be a carry a diff, but I mean, Barrel's no joke. Mm -hmm. Barrel's I, no I, joke at all. Yeah. Because I think, I think the bot matchup is probably pretty even. I think the mid matchup is probably pretty even as well. And I think the difference would be Faker's pool is just going to be bigger. I actually think Pilshik is better than Owner, and I think Zeus is better than. Is Zeus or Zeus? I don't Zeus. know. We've literally heard both it all worlds. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Matter. Because I think I think it was Zeus be or Zeus because there was also a top laner named Zeus Z yeah. Z uh O O S. Oh in okay. LCK. So that's how Zeus. 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 Yeah, so Zeus. Okay. Um, Zeus. But I think Zeus is definitely a lot better than Kingen. Ah, mm. uh, I don't know, man. I'm gonna say three one SKT. Yeah. All right. Is he doing it? Is he doing it? Look at I'm his not face. really sure. I'm not <laughs> really sure. Brain, my brain says SKT, my heart says DRX. Yeah. 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 I think that's everyone. Yeah. My heart says DRX, and I think I'm going for DRX because mm. I think I'm the only person in the world wow. who predicted them last time, and I'm not the only person in the world predicting it this time. I'm definitely not. They have some love. They have some fans. They have some real energy behind them, and... I wish I was going to the worlds, but I'm going to be listening, and I don't know who the crowd's going to get behind, because it's Faker versus the underdog, and mm -hmm. the underdog is nobody, isn't nobody, it's Deft, and that's just, I think, the it's the sixth man. The, the, the audience is truly a player in the game. You can hear it and see it in the play in DRX versus Gen.G. You hear Gen.G chants, it's quiet. It happens, you can hear it. And you hear DX, DRX follow up, and it is thundering. Oh, it was. I can hear it from yeah. my house. <laughs> and freaking not even close to the stadium. Yeah. And I just don't know. This is just <laughs> such a magical time. Like, <laughs> NA had to die to win, this. you should vote T1. You know, we got to be I'm, part yeah. of that crowd, right? It was also I voted for was DRX. Crowd. I'm going to vote DRX. 3-2. They're going to take it. It's going to be really hard fought. It's going to be so close. T1's going to look like they're probably going to be dominant for most of the series. And it's really going to be up to DRX being crafty, being tenacious, not giving up, finding weird angles to make something happen. Because you know what? Barrel's a freaking genius. This guy finds the weirdest angles to get a win in. And you know what? Kingen, I was a doubter. And I'm not going to say he's better than Zeus. But that guy's clutch, okay? He's not the most consistent, but he is clutch. That's what I noticed in Kingen's play, is he'll find something weird to make positive. Um, I'm really excited for this matchup. I do think Gumiyushi is playing out of his mind. And yeah, I'm going to argue Gumiyushi is playing a lot better than uh, than uh, Deft is. But Deft doesn't need to, right? Deft has his friends and teammates to carry him along. And I think that he will pay it back forward in this next series. So DRX is taking it 3-2. I'm sorry, All Faker. All right. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's, you know, I think Kevin said it best. It's like, whoever wins, it's like, I don't think anybody's, like, really that upset because it's a happy ending, I think, either Dude, way. What a unless magical way. Yeah, it's unless you're just timeline. a diehard fan of one of the teams, you know, yeah. and you've been like that for so long. But I, for I me... I want to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's the fine. biggest advantage DRX has is just draft because teams have to ban this Heimerdinger bullshit. Yeah, yeah, true. Have to ban Heimerdinger, but does they DRX have to ban Rise? Rise? Yeah. yeah. Do they have they to ban Rise? Rise? Yeah. It's gonna be really weird. This draft's gonna be so but confusing, man. Does Does T one <laughs> need to ban Kindred? <laughs> it's like I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. We'll too, yeah. But uh, yeah. So yeah. let me let me think about this because here's here's my here's where my 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 mind is going. Right, DRX has had the toughest mental i have seen throughout this entire tournament first of all oh, you have yeah. people already from the beginning saying you're not gonna make it you're not gonna do well and then here they go they get out of groups they're they gotta make it 
in plans first. They make it through plans. Then they make it through groups. And then in quarterfinals, nobody's expecting you to play. Then death literally is one auto from the Nexus, and it doesn't happen. And then they lose that game. And then they come back and reverse sweep. Like, what? Oh then they come into the series, and it's literally like an 80-20 split between people thinking that, you know, Gen G is going to win over DR. I should have bet, man. What am I doing Dude, with my life? It's Holy like, cow! <laughs> if, if anything, like, I wonder if the underdog theme has fueled them because it's like look they doubt us every time and we prove them wrong and if anything they are underdogs in this series for sure even if your heart wants them to win on paper they are extreme oh, underdogs it's not, close. it's not even close <laughs> it's not even close man and so here's the thing is that even though they were underdogs against gen g for some of the same reasons kevin was saying like it's freaking Faker, dude. Like, he is not Chovy. He does show yeah, up true. in the world yeah. stage. I do think Guma and Karia is just overall a better bot lane. But even if even if uh, Deft and uh, and uh, Barrel played better, I don't think Zekka would be able to, to carry, you know, oh, because he won't. I don't think he'll have that kind of lead or dominance over Faker. You know what I mean? And then, obviously, I think Zeus is, is just better than Kingen. And Jungle could be a toss, right? Um, but that's, that's why I think there's just too many weapons, uh, in T1's, you know, playbook and the diversity of their champion pools, the strategies that they can pull out, like they could play through bot, they could play through mid, they could play through top. Like, what do you do against that team? And as much as I want DRX to make the perfect underdog story, I just don't think they have enough. So once again, I'm doubting them and I'm going to have to say T1 I think it's three one, but you know what? I'm also not ha I'm also not sad. Too sad if uh, DRX wins because that would be a nice story. I think in my heart of hearts, though, like just to see Faker transcend like this longevity, like this thing where I actually didn't think he would ever make it this far again. I actually didn't think he could win again. I thought maybe I had a slight chance, thinking maybe he might get it uh, last year, but I can't believe he's actually at the doorstep. And this is just amazing to see at, at his age and, you know, with as much time as he's put in, with as many rosters he's gone through, with his, you know, different coaching changes. Like, it's so exciting to me. And I'm, you know, I'm just happy for him. And I hope that he can take this young team, you know, under his wing and, and get the dub. So my vote is 3-1 uh, T1. That's, when that's was when with. was the last time that we had all the tournament favors out? Like so early on, yeah. JDG, Top Esports, and Gen G were the tournament favors by most people's standards. I think some people had some T1 in there, but a lot of people were doubting them, right? After they lost so terribly in the LCK finals, it it's just the massive change in meta. It's so crazy, the the different time space, everything. I will say and, though, if you remember from the very beginning, I said my team was T1. That's <laughs> Mostly true. at the time that's though. True. It wasn't because of any genius. The, the TSM fan is also it fan wasn't of any. Well, <laughs> Alistair, you didn't let me, you didn't let me finish. I, I it wasn't because of any genius analytical minds that I had. It was simply because I wanted Faker to win. No, <laughs> it's exactly. It's, 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 <laughs> same thing. It's, it's, it's exactly. TSM mental. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. definitely TSM mental right there. Well, I was I agreeing it. with you. I was just going to. You beat me to it. <laughs> That's all I was saying. You, you beat me to it. Faker was out this early. Was twenty eighteen. When KT oh. and RNG were yeah. out in the quarters. Oh, uh, yep, that's true. Yep, G that's very G2 true. In, or was it G2? No, maybe it wasn't G2 that year, but they just G2 didn't make it year. all the way. Yeah, I think some people thought Fnatic might do well as well um, yeah, early on. They, and they, they made it to finals, but they, they had to the easy route. I, I think do well in favor are different terms, but you're yeah. right. They did think yeah, yeah, yeah. that strong. They were not this a favorite, when, though. Yeah. yeah. This is this was still off the back of six years or five years in a row of Korea wins. So like yeah. it yep. was a very strange year for KT to go out that early. They had Mata on that team, dude. Yeah. yeah. I mean that was the real finals, right? KT versus IG in, in quarters. That was the real finals. Like Who's let's the be KT real. Who was the KT ADC that year? I forgot. Who? Was, was it Pre Was it Prey? No, it wasn't Prey. It wasn't no, Death, was it? No, it wasn't. Was it I'm looking it up. Well, I, I'm I'm at a complete loss because my memory doesn't go back that far because my, my brain is <laughs> old. Um, uh, yeah. Should we go while you're looking that up? Do you guys want to go to some news on the docket? Should we go there? Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk right. about it. Uh, first news. thing, uh, back to the LCS is uh, Danny. So EG is looking to explore options because it's looking like 
he's not going to be in for next season, uh, which then leads to the question is, is Danny, you know, if he's taking a break for the year, like, is he done? Is he retiring or would teams even want him? Uh, and then maybe some options for EG. So let's start there in any of those questions. You can hit all of them, um, you know, as far as what are your thoughts on Danny? Is he done? Would teams want him? Would you want him if you were a team owner? And, you know, what are some options you think for for EG? All right, quickly for Alistair's uh, info, Def was data carry. It was Def, Mata, bot lane, ah. U Cloud slash, slash pond mid lane, score, jungle, and then top lane smith. Like that, that roster yeah. was incredible. Insane uh, roster. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, on to the Danny news. If he actually is retiring or at least taking a break, it could be that uh, it's really bad news. Uh, honestly, this is like mm -hmm. one of our on paper most promising NA born talents in a long time. Like, even if Double came back, like, the, the, Danny's ceiling could be higher, right? Because we just don't know. He's already won in the championship as a rookie or. No, actually, rookie yeah, like rookie yeah. ass, yeah, like yeah, half yeah. a split rookie or whatever. Yeah. And he had so much talent in Laking, which is what like is really hard to train. Like, why can we not compete with the best teams in the world? It's not always just because of our early games. Sometimes it is. It's just because we can't like hold it in. Like once they stall long enough, they will almost always defeat our best teams, right? And having him, having JoJo get better, that would have been so exciting, even if they weren't on the same team. Um, we don't know the reason, so it's hard to speculate. I will say that like because they said it was because of no pressure and all that i think that's really concerning like if we have someone who can literally win it all and still there's too much pressure for him to like play it is partially like his personality but it's also partially just like the environment they're being raised in like are culturally are we just like not good enough under pressure like we have people here who are playing like some of these games we were watching in quarters and semis between the asian teams it was insane the amount of like decisions that were being made across the map in real time all the time and the level play these guys were exhibiting, like that is the most insane pressure ever. Like in some of these cases, like you're you're like playing in this case, NA cheers for mostly everyone because NA's not in the tournament anymore. <laughs> but in some of in a lot of cases, you're just not playing on the home turf either. And they you still see magical plays all the time. I think if we don't get our mental like fortitude or psych like you know, good sports psych or mental health stuff like in order never gonna get anywhere we can have all the hands in the world but like yeah if everyone just tilts or just can't have the right mental for training and stuff like jojo even said i just stopped practicing after i won as much because i didn't think it was worth it right and then he said he regretted it after um mm -hmm. they lost yeah it's like no jojo has the right attitude he's a grinder and even he was just like eh, i just don't feel the point and honestly maybe there isn't a point if everyone's leaving champs queue and our solo queue's ass yeah so I hope Danny does come back. It sounds like he won't be here for at least a split or two. Um, but if he does come back, based on our my analysis from before, it will hurt him. This now for sure. Um, it will mean that he's probably going to be picked up to a mid team or a falling top team. I don't think he's going to be welcomed back to a top top team that's looking to seriously make a run, unless he's like taking a huge pay cut. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with Kevin. I mean, it it hurts for him, but at the same time like that's kind of how the business is i mean if you want to like try out for skt if you're not like 18 your chances are don't even bother wasting your time right like obviously it's a different culture but at the same time like there are teams who are trying to at least win because winning the split has a good paycheck but just if you're gonna take a year or even a split off that's really damaging like Honestly, like we were talking about if Faker went to military service, like if he was gone for a year, he's not going to be the same player. We, we're no. seeing it with Rush mm -hmm. right now. Like he was gone for a year. Was it two? I don't remember. Two. Many two. Years. Many, many and years. I have no idea. Yeah. Sure. Sure. It's it, even if he only takes a year off, that's still a long time. The game changes a decent amount every two weeks. An entire year. Sure. He might still play the game. Not like competitively not on the team but there it's two different games man like it's mm. it's really hard and i think he's just shooting himself in the foot yeah i mean he look at bjergsen to decide if he wants to do it or not i, I think yeah. that's what it comes down to i i think bjergsen is a great example of what happens when you take a year off you go from maybe the best performing mid in in summer 2020 to coaching for a year 
he's not it's not like he's not even playing he's like in the game mm-hmm. he's like following the scene he's a coach and he comes back in 2022 and he just doesn't look the same he's just not the same caliber of player not clutch enough and, and he's young so i'll give danny the fact that young people are just genuinely more malleable and they can bounce back easier right that's just flexibility in your bones flexibility in your mind so I'm not going to say it's over for Danny because anything can happen. And I will say that in the community, how it is now, yeah, it's pretty hard to take a break and come back. All right, you have to be double after Bjergsen. Bjergsen or double if took a, a month off. He came back, still won the whole thing, right? But then he got kicked from TSM. I do think though that you shouldn't underestimate how good a player is, regardless of time, because. Their skill and their talent is inherent to them as an individual. And yeah, I can change and look differently over time goes. I think that we should live in a world where it is more socially acceptable to take a month off or take a split off or take a year off. We're not there yet. Maybe we'll get there. And maybe it's, we're not there yet because no one has done it well. Um, but if we do get someone to do it well, they can pave the way. It would be great if Danny could do that because... We all want him to succeed. We all want him to be healthy. And we all want him to help himself and na to win stuff um i think that the way the community is right now it's too soon there we're at the edges of being accepting of his of mental health as a problem as a real disadvantage not a disadvantage as a real obstacle that a player has to overcome um and yeah danny got a lot of uh support for it taking a year off is taking a really big next step and testing how well and accepting the community is going to be. I hope that if he takes this year off because he needs to, because he has a long-term plan, I don't know, that is really well thought out. It's really well planned. It's created by professionals. Go to therapy. Do other stuff. Find other ways to nurture your brain. Get some exercise in there, like something to make us happy to know that you're not just giving up on your dream because you got butt hurt at the end of the of the last season. Because that's kind of what it felt like. He collapsed to the pressure, to the social media influence, and inspired, and maybe some of his teammates said a couple of nasty things, and he couldn't handle it. I feel for the kid, but I hope that he realizes these obstacles are not enough to stop him from being a great North American player. So do what you got to do. I hope he comes back, though. And if I was a team and he tried out and he told me he had a plan of how to make sure he's, this is not going to happen again, I would take him in a heartbeat because, I mean, teams got to invest in the future. Yeah. I mean, here's here's my only thing. Like, And so I want to be delicate with my words here because I, again, am a big advocate for mental health. Um, I will say, though, there's such a fine balance, right, because NA wants – well, we claim to want to be the best in the world. We claim to want to be able to compete against uh, Asian teams, Eastern teams, right? But the reality is that until someone can prove that taking these, these you know, uh, mental breaks or these breaks in the split and breaks in the years and then actually show it to prove more efficient or more winning you know or if that's the word right like it, it yeah. proves better results in international tournaments that we can't have it both ways so sure. i if like um if north america and we're saying like look we we actually think that um you know we should foster this environment of like players can take more control over when they need mental health days or weeks or whatever then that's so that's fine that's the direction we take but i don't think it's fair enough then to still complain about us not winning worlds because we we can see the type of environment that those teams work in willingly. Um, now I'm not saying that it's the most healthy way. Maybe there's a very bad work life balance, but maybe in that culture it's it's okay. Like that's accepted. That's normal. It's not taboo or whatever. But for us as Westerners, it is a little different, right? So it's a different style and culture. Um, but we could see that that way that they're doing has proven to work it wins yeah. it wins over yeah. and over and over again whether you agree with it or not their style their training regiment their the way they run teams is better it's the same in other things like soccer like na us is not good at soccer right <laughs> and uh, there's lots of variants there but i will just say that a lot of the reason is because our infrastructure is not the same as the rest of the world it hasn't been we're catching up 
but it hasn't been. We're starting to slowly see that, uh, you know, our way of training is not as efficient, even though we might think it is because it doesn't translate like other sports. And so we're now taking a lot of notes at how uh, other countries train their players. And I think it's the same thing. It's just, you know, I feel for Danny. I want him to get the help that he deserves. But this game is brutal if you're not staying with it. Like, I just don't know. Yes, he's young. He's malleable. But it's and it's his decision. Like, I want him to make the best decision for his life. But it's not fair for me to, you know, because as North American fans, our expectation, our want is for him to be good. And it's like, you're so talented. You should keep playing. You should keep playing. But maybe that's just for him. Maybe that's not the best call for his life. Maybe it isn't. Maybe, you know, and that sucks as a fan. But that's his life, and I hope he makes the best decision for himself. Like, if league is not the career that he needs to go for the sake of his mental health, then that's fine. And so he should do what he needs to do. But I do think that this move is uh, – I'm just going to say it, man. I think it's a career killer. Um, yeah, it's a bit of career suicide. I think it's a career killer yeah. in the sense that – let's. <laughs> like, and I said this in Discord. Unless he's showing teams that he's like – if the same level, if not better, you know, mechanically and in his play style, I don't know what team would want him just for the sheer fact of like, can I count on this guy? Like yeah. he might be good in the regular season, but when we really need him in the finals or whatever, or it's getting tense because there will be tense team moments where teams are like at each other's throats for the sake of a common goal. Will he be able to get through that to work for the better good of the team? I don't know as management if I want that on my team and, you know, and that's really tough because I, I'm trying to understand for the guy. Uh, so that's my spiel, but transitioning into that now, is there, uh, you know, what do you do for your EG? Do you stick with Kaori? Do you pick up double lift? Hello, hello, mm-hmm. double lift or like double lift uh, Jojo or is there, is there any other ADC options that, that you see, you know? Um, I mean, what do you really do as EG right now? I mean, if that, minor region rumor comes true they probably can find like the best 80 carry in some minor region that did well Mm -hmm. Uh, even brazil did well last like somewhat well right what was his name the dude with the the bot diff dude i mean like oh i think yeah brands like obviously he might not be at the level carriers maybe he's higher i don't know but there's a lot of options i don't know calorie is good enough to build the year around because he has strengths but he has some very clear weaknesses He's already played in Turkish League before. I don't know how much better he's going to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for uh, the level that EG's at, they should still look, right? They need to find someone who is like Danny. If they want to go back to MSI, go back to Worlds, and actually make do damage. Mm-hmm. Um, but everyone's cutting budgets. So the yep. bad news is we might see less exciting rosters on paper. Uh, the good news is we have a slightly higher chance of seeing well-constructed roster because they have to actually be resourceful. And the other good news is the price of players will drop. Yeah, the market is gonna is not going to have so much inflation in it, right? Like, frankly, as a liquid fan, like I have to admit, like liquid is a large part of the reason why all the prices just went so high up, right? Mm-hmm. And now that they're spending less, I mean, no one else is really going to need to spend that much. Um, so that could mean we could see a super team, but it's just like a super McDonald's cost. <laughs> <laughs> super McDonald's, I like it. Uh, uh, yeah. You're not gonna see CEOs bragging about how much they spent on their roster. A la, was it Jack or was it Reggie? I maybe both at different times on Twitter. I remember Reggie was like six six million dollars for Sword Art or some crap. That was crazy. Yeah, I remember man. that too. So I was like, oh, Liquid's mm. whole roster is seven million. So I don't know what why Liquid is getting so much ex- specific shit this year when we had the ten perks million for Oscar. perks, man. Oh my god. That, I thought it was like eleven. I don't know. That never fucking yeah. goes up every it was time. Too I much. Did it. It was yeah. way too much <laughs> for perks, dude. <laughs> All that to flash Renekton and Sun Award. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. I mean, okay, good stuff. they won a split. They did win a split. Notice. They won yeah. a split and they got out of groups. But it's the go. most explicit, <laughs> most expensive split ever won. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, price to performance wasn't worth it in my opinion. But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I don't know, man. It's I don't know what EG is gonna do. This is what I want all the teams to do, just in a general sense. Specifically, it's really hard for me to say, not knowing, you know, the contract situations, the budgets, and all that stuff. I am down for just some rando. I really am, dude. Just give me some rando. I don't know, man. I I I'm just a more. I guess I'm a more long-reaching, sensible fan. Where even if all the NA teams look like crap, 
-hmm. all year long. And we go to Worlds. We go 0-18. But we have a bunch of randos. We have a bunch of young North American upstarts trying their best and struggling and learning. I'm going to be like, that's okay. I'm actually yeah. going to take it. I'm going to be like, you know what? This is what I've been asking for. This is what I've been hoping for is that I just wish we did it earlier. I just mm -hmm. wish we took that time to invest in really young talent and impress, like create impressionable habits on our newer players because we are so used to following the habits of our older players. Mm -hmm. Play less, relax more, go stream, go party. Mm -hmm. I want a bunch of 17 and 18 year old kids with no name, nothing on their back, a crappy paycheck maybe, just to say this is all I have in life, to go all in, play your hearts out, think of every little strategy and detail, wake up and breathe and eat League of Legends, and hopefully this year, next year, whenever it happens, we do something. Because, yeah, I love Someday and Impact and Jensen and all these other guys, but... Even though they're our best players, maybe it's time to go. Maybe it's time to start something new. Just yeah. burn it all down and reset and create a completely new infrastructure for every single player. Yeah. I mean, let, I, let's be honest, right? We If we win three games in group stage next year with a bunch of rookie <laughs> players, nothing changes. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that was nothing changes. yeah. We won yeah. three this year yeah. with a bunch of the old guard. If we do the same thing next year with a bunch of rookies what's to say that these rookies aren't going to do go you know six and nine or whatever next it is year. or six and 12 next year yeah yeah, yeah. nice yeah, 69 I, think... <laughs> I, I don't know math math failed me there math I'm sorry. Uh, i i think um you know i i like really i really do like what you said mitchell for the sake of i think gone is this thinking of like Oh, it's exciting with all these big names and like, oh, putting these big names together on the same team is going to be really good because now they make the super team and it's going to perform well at Worlds. You know what? I think we just got lazy and fat, you know, uh, so to speak, in a sense that <laughs> yeah. like we got these bloated contracts. We're living it up. Uh, you know, it is kind of this thing where we're just going to keep paying the same old players you know, these big paychecks, importing big names from other countries to get over here. But you know what? Forget that. Let's just get hungry players, players who want to play, who like there is no fat paycheck. You have to like earn your way into that spot. You're you're there because like you really just want to make this your career and you're going to play and grind your butt off to like really make it. And I think greatness will will come from that kind of environment as opposed to this. Like if I look and I see I'm busting my butt off, but then they just signed double lift again. I mean, I'm not saying double, but you know what I mean? Like if they sign, yeah. uh, you know, a recurring pro over and over again, who's, you know, been in the league for so long and hasn't actually proven results. Like what's the incentive for me? But if I see like, oh, there's. It's kind of fresh grounds, and we're kind of starting to see that transition now from Steve's whole speech about going in a new direction. If Team Liquid is the one that's setting that precedent, you know, they set the one with the high inflation market values for all the players. If they're setting the new precedent for like, no, we're going with players who are just hungry, uh, new players, new talent, value, you know, it's not about the fat contracts. And I'm excited. Then I can get behind that region if I see them busting their tail off and really trying. And what Alistair said, you put it in perspective, even if they only win three games in, in groups next year, uh, hey, we did the same thing, and we did it with with rookies. And so I'm okay with that. Um, honestly, I, I think I'm with you. Let's go with a rando. Let's just uh, do that with most of NA. Let's just see what happens, man. Let's roll the dice, burn it all down, and start from scratch. I'm ready. I mean, if this year was so disappointing. Um, yeah. All right, speaking of that, <laughs> speaking of the import that we just had, Hans, Sama is uh, going to G2, I believe, uh, if this trade goes through. Um, it's a rumor, yeah. It's a rumor. It's pretty legit, though. I yeah, it's a legit rumor, I guess. Yeah. yeah it's a, it's a, it <laughs> um, and I guess that's that's interesting, right? But I guess what is even more interesting to me is the Reddit thread you posted there, uh, Mitchell, just saying that he had actually wanted to go to G2 before, but it was blocked by Rogue. And so that would create some interesting discussion points because it kind of looks like he was forced into the LCS uh, just yep. because he couldn't go to another LEC team. So or or a LEC team he wanted to go to. Um, so what are your thoughts on on that move in general? I mean, does that make G2 better in your opinion uh, after what you saw in LCS? Does he bounce back or or whatever? What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, so we already have a case study on this, right? Perks came yep. over, legendary player, played all right. You know, they did win a split, but like he was up and down at best, right? Went back to Vitality. I think he individually played better than he did in LCS, which isn't a high bar to clear. Uh, yeah. But they didn't get that far. Uh, I think Hansama is an on paper upgrade, even if he's just like if he's just slightly better than he played in LCS, he's probably an upgrade over Flack because while I think Flack was serviceable, he was not at the caliber you needed for a G two. Like serviceable is a very generous. Like I'm saying, like seventh place, sixth place, eighty carry, not top Dude, two. I take right? Yarnin over fucking Flack. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, yeah. he's younger, so I I, ha I think he has maybe room to grow. That's the only serviceable. Mm. That's the only way you would invest in. Target miss is good. So you know he has he's in good hands when he goes back. He has cap still. I don't get why they're getting Han Sama though if they're dropping Yankos. Like they must have very big aspirations or very bad management. Because to me, I'm like that's not cheap. Even if they got him at a lower cost than TL got him, it's probably not cheap, right? And why are you dropping your star jungler who has great synergy with caps when you're still aspiring to be a great team? Mm -hmm. Like it's not budget year just because we dropped Carlos. Somehow we got Han Sama or we're going to get Han Sama. So I'm. All I have to say is I predict that this is implying they're going for a really big jungler, but I can't think of anyone bigger yeah. than Yankos in the West. So it's like, is it an import or is it some talent they think will like pop off, right? Like another El Yoya esque pickup, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think G2 has a scouting team for that now that they don't have perks, so we'll see. But G2 I think... Kanavi. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> with Mao right here, now everything's possible, right? There's like, I mean, it's, it's, true. A, it's a Korean jungler. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing that being said, when you have caps, it's easy to recruit. It's just like when you have Faker, when you have Bjergsen, you just recruit for free, right? It's not yep. that you're a great. I okay, small rant. I'm so tilted when I say like T1's scouting is the best. I'm like, it's the T1, <laughs> dude. The number one, number two, number three yeah. players come out solo and they're like, I want to play with Faker. I yep. want to be on T1. Dude, of course. T1 has been around since the early 2000s or maybe the late 1990s from StarCraft Brew War, okay? Like, th this roster is something that people grew up. It's like, oh, the Yankees came are just such good scouters, you know? Or the Golden <laughs> State Warriors are such good scouters yeah. for this generation, 15 years from now. I'm like, no, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> they're not anymore, at least. Everyone just wants to go there because it's just where you would go, right? The mm -hmm. legacy is there. The fan base is there. The training red is probably very good. As because that's why they're so famous, but Faker's also there. A living mm -hmm. legend is there. That's why they keep hit, making more hits than they have misses, right? I would actually say their scouting is kind of shit if you think about it because they have so many cases of, like Tom was on the roster for how long? Blink 612 was on the roster for how long? Like they Yo, kept missing. Don't talk crap about Pyrian, our <laughs> NA prodigy, our only NA import. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the guy who actually. <laughs> Was able to make Faker sub out. Only you have <laughs> ever done that in history. Dude, they've Let's missed a lot in. more than you would think, right? Like, kind of like, but the thing is, they always get like some other star right after, right? Because they're T1. So I don't know. I, I'm sick of all the circle. I like T1, but I'm, I'm sick of the circle jerking around how good their scouting is, how good everything is. Let me do the drafts are sometimes garbage. They let the players run the roster, uh, run the drafts, it seems like. It's like a lot of that is like a, a beautiful mess. Yeah, I'm gonna say with that roster, with the drafting, I feel like T1 actually kind of hit the golden meta where they can draft the same way, but it works in this meta. Because in all the previous metas, they've been drafting kind of the same wonky play for my solo lane, don't care about the comp thing, and they didn't win MSI, they didn't win domestically, and then they get to this meta where bot lane is heavily nerfed. And all these fighters are like kind of in the same spot. A lot of these supportive jungle champs are significantly nerfed. And you're like, oh, wait, this is perfect for T1. Holy cow. They can actually pick just four carries and still win. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Yeah. Um, Han Sama, though. I mean, I don't know. Steve is, it made me realize Steve is kind of the MVP CEO. Like, he let Doublelift go to TSM, his biggest rival competitor, because Doublelift asked him. Because Steve was like, you're my friend, you're my, you're, you know, I'm going to treat mm -hmm. you like a person and help you out as best as I can. That's pretty goaded, honestly, because honestly, Steve kind of screwed himself over from winning titles he after did. he did that. Yeah. He 100% sacrificed his company to help one guy out, one friend out. That's pretty dope. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I haven't liked Steve's direction with the team he's taken in roster building. But I will say him as a person, just through interviews, through all the actions I've heard, everything I've heard from other players, pretty goaded, pretty awesome guy. 
um, Carlos, and I guess Rogue, are all about the money, are all about the wins. They will do whatever it takes. They'll screw over any player. They don't care. Um, we're going to lock you up in contract jail. You're not going to go to Fnatic. You're not going to go to G2 because you're going to hurt us. And then you know what? Both Perks and Hansama have a quick year vacation in NA where they seem pretty miserable and they come back. I don't know, man. I, I just I just hope Hansama plays better. I hope he yeah. can go he can just play better. <laughs> I will say too, like, uh man, it's kind of like at least with Steve too, like, okay, you're kind of giving him to a rival org, but it's still in your region. And it's like if it makes that team like their chances of being, you know, really competitive to not just win domestically, but maybe even internationally, then you're still helping your region in a sense because you're keeping the talent domestic, right? Like, imagine, like, if we had some really goaded play, like JoJo. If JoJo left, or if, like, you know, uh, if Evil Geniuses was like, yeah, you can't go to, like, you know, Team Liquid or something like that, and he had to go somewhere else, I'd be pretty pissed. Because yeah. it's like, dude, that's our talent. Like, he's like our top, you know, native mid laner talent right now. Like, and because you don't want to give him to a competing LCS team, you l make him go overseas. Like, I would be pretty upset. And then now when we play whatever region he goes to, like, I'm upset about that. So yeah. I think it's a pretty, like, just F you move, like, when G2 does that to his region. Like saying, yeah, I'm not going to let Perks go to Fnatic or wherever it is, you yeah. know, I'm going to, you know, and he comes over here. It's good for us. But yeah, that kind of, you know, screws over your region. And same thing with Hans here, you know, and not just that, but his career. Like, wh may what if he had just stayed in, you know, LEC? Like maybe he, he would have played so much better, dude. Yeah. I bet you if he was on G2, G2 would have been hella smurf this year. Yeah, it's way better and, than one in five. Yeah, I mean, not just the fact that it's in a you know the environment of like maybe better training and all that, but just the fact that he had to uproot his life, come all the way over here. That takes a toll on you. Like really, like get to know yeah, a did. whole different culture. It's like crazy. Uh, so the fact that you know you you kind of screwed him over in that sense, like in his career, and you know having kind of like a gap year, so to speak. Um, then yeah, that's just kind of a, a poopy move, uh, once again. So, um, I'm just hoping that, yeah, I mean, I, w I wish him the best. Like I wish he had worked out in team liquid, but uh, I do think it's an upgrade. And, uh, I just think it's weird that this would have been awesome if, if, uh, Yankos was still on the team, honestly, like, I think this would have been so dope to see this team. Uh, unfortunately that's not going to happen. So anyways, uh, all right. I, I mean, if I, you want me to be honest, yeah, I'm kind of like i'm kind of glad that the hansama experiment didn't work out yeah because we're, we're seeing a lot of these imports come in and just look like trash mm -hmm. and and, <laughs> and and just leave and yeah i i'm kind of enjoying it not be not because i like seeing the teams fall but it's just because it it's one step closer to just you know, it's actually, you know, having an infrastructure for growing talent instead of just pay paying a bunch of money, wasting a bunch of money for, like, mediocre results or results that you could have gone if you just, like, taken a small risk and invested into that risk. Because if you – they if TL doesn't make it to Worlds, but they're playing with Yeon, right? What's the difference? They're paying so much less, and they're building up a player who they can have for the next year, and maybe they do make it – out anyways and they've still saved so much money i think it's better in the long term yeah, yeah. I, I i can agree with that because in disguise yeah. team liquid yeah, definitely had bad, the ultimate but... ultimate experiment of like can we get all these veterans and like top brains of the game together on one team and like really make it happen and obviously it didn't pan out like they didn't even make it to world so i think in a sense that was good in that it let us know that that doesn't work. It's not going to work, and so we need to kind of go the other direction. So I I could I I see what you're saying, and that actually it, does make sense. It's a bit of like it's one of those sunk cost fallacies, though, right? Or one of the other fallacies. It's like, doesn't it feel like we already kind of knew though? Like, yeah. Haven't we kind of known for a couple years now? I think that so. Super teams yes, don't work. Yes, but at the same time, I mean, it, it hasn't worked unless you have double lift on the team. Yeah, but right, let's never for way. international, right? Double yeah. only went to MSI Finals once, and he's been yeah. on a handful of super teams. And you just have to think, right? Like, if NA actually cares about making it far at Worlds, then nothing we've done at mm -hmm. all, remotely 
in the last 12 years has really done much. I'm going to say 2018 C9. They played well and they did get lucky with the meta, but that's, yeah, they were banking on a complete collapse of entire region. Like, I mean, we have never actually done anything that has gotten us far at Worlds intentionally, right? Every year, it's been the same thing after the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It needs to completely change. Yeah, exactly. We're not doing anything to get better. To yep. be fair, I, I think that is part of the issue where the orgs don't necessarily care about winning. Mm, okay, that's fair too. That's probably a big part of it because if they're in it for clout and they're in it for clicks on their website and Twitter followers and sponsorship yeah. deals and that all they care about is having big names because they have a big brand behind them, then yeah, NA is pretty doomed in that regard. I yeah. hope that's not the case. I hope that some teams wake up and realize that you should go for legacy and you should go for doing well at Worlds because you'll make people happier. And I don't know, maybe it's just because we're a bunch of peasants, but maybe money's not everything. Maybe legacy and accomplishing something great and making something new is better than just making a bunch of money. I mean, just the right. way I see it, right? It's like, if you look at pretty much every sport, that you, any, any sport really, like if you look at all of the like legacy, like the really good teams or organizations, they're scouting people out of high school or whatever yeah. the equivalent is, right? Like they're mm -hmm. they're building up these yep. players. They you've got college football teams who are getting who are scouting people who are like freshman type thing. Like they're they're getting ready That's for true. these players well in advance. Yeah. And a NA is just like, okay, so we have this whole system. We have champions queue. We have amateur with uh, upsurge. We have academy. But I'm gonna blow twelve million on this mid laner. Yeah. yeah who's yeah. gonna be here for one year. Yeah. Yeah. Like realistically, like there's a reason why all of these like sports teams build people up from like build people up from the ground. And and it's to be because fair, it's reliable and it works. And to be fair, that they did that's what they do even in like soccer. Uh like these all these big sports teams already have academies for like high school college players which then move into like their like d1 league and then then they can get called up to their main league and it's not yeah. new i mean korea t1's pretty much doing this right like they T1 have one like, and yeah you know? as, so yeah, it's, not anything, it's not anything it's not anything new it's just that I mean, we EU, lpl and korea all do it like all yeah. the teams do it for the most part i mean well that's, like, Cloud that's what i mean also do it yeah. Yeah, we're we're pretty much beating a dead horse. Like I yeah. think we we know it, but I think it's finally I think it's finally uh apparent do maybe it that, now. Yeah, do it now like and maybe do to the fans. Now. Maybe to the fans we're finally saying like, "All right, that's enough orgs. Like we want to win now. Like this is crap. Stop so, giving I, I me just, this this crap I, with like all these names and making us money and all this crap. I just want to I want us to win. I'm tired of it. I think the business goal is just to make as much money as possible. I just don't think winning is like really necessarily the priority. Yeah. yeah. It's Good okay. It's all right. Now with LCS viewership being changed and everything and all these Happening. teams getting budgeted, this is the time to change your goals, to change your trajectories companies. You're going to have to pay a lot less in salaries. Yeah. So now you can maybe actually afford to focus on winning. Because salaries is that this? I think we're in a good direction so far. We'll yeah. just have to see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm hopeful. Anybody, I'm hopeful. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Because uh, I have one, but I'll let if anybody else has one. Um, yeah, one of yeah, my uh, final thoughts, I guess, would be like, I mean, we were doing okay with some of our super teams, like three three. Okay, NA has been improving for a while now. It's just the other other regions have been widening the gap. Like there was a period of time where Korea was getting weaker in my mind um, when they were like just losing to Europe, like they were objectively weaker, right? In terms of results. And this was the time where NA also broke through into MSI finals. Like we have been improving. Like last year, NA went 3-3. They went 1-1 against, or Liquid went 1-1 against everyone in their group. It was like a group with, what was it? LNG and whoever else was in that group. It's not that like, I, again, it, just because we have one bad year doesn't mean that everything was going wrong. I don't see any reason that they had to believe that 2021's results was, Anti super team. They I built think a team it's... with Alfari, yeah. Santorin, Jensen, okay, tactical and core JJ, right? Like for for all intents and purposes, that's basically a super team. With especially with Alfari's stock and the early parts of the year, they just couldn't win at the end. 
I'm going to give you a new perspective, Kevin, okay? All the years have been bad. Fighting for scraps to get out of groups is not success. It's not winning, and it's not fun to watch. I don't care that we've been steadily improving by one game a year to slightly make it out of groups, to not make it out of groups, to make it to maybe quarters. I don't care anymore. It's scrapped. It's at the bottom of the barrel. I'm done. Expectations be damned. Let's win the whole thing. Yeah. We're never going to get there if we keep doing the same thing for the last 12 years. Let's yeah. do something new, completely new, not to fight for the bottom, but to win the whole thing. And that's what I think we should go for. Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. Where's the league going to be if there's no investment in it? Like, let's say, okay, the time it takes to build a league, right? To do the training, to get, like, actual structure of, like, hungry, like... It's not going to be easy, there. and there's no one answer. Yeah, well, then it's not going to be easy. Then I think it's just like saying, just do the right thing, right? And that's how we'll get there. I that think is that's true. Just like a yeah, it's, it's not a cop out. It's the only way to win. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's no other you, avenue. How are you going to win if your league doesn't exist anymore? If no one gives a shit, if then it doesn't exist. Then that's okay. how it goes. So if we'll you're going to fail, then you're going to fail. You have to overcome all of your difficulties. It's not easy. It's nearly impossible. But there's only one way up, man. Yeah. Things it's have not to get easy better before they get worse is the way i see it like, yeah it's just gonna hurt and well, i what, yeah it goes back to that balance again though of what you're saying because what mitchell's saying is like we we want to win right and mm -hmm. if we're trying to create an environment of winning it's going to be bad it's going to be ugly when we do that you lose money you lose sponsorship which again for these companies to survive they need that and so that's what alistair's saying like Com these companies they just need us they need or want to survive and make money and maybe winning isn't their number one priority because you know maybe it is if i get the scraps out of na you know and we get one game better in group you know in uh or we make it out of groups or we do one game better in groups like i can take that to my na investors or whatever and say look we did better even though it's, in our opinion, like it's just the same old thing. We, big whoop. We did one game better. So from a fan perspective, I'm 100% with you, Mitchell. I don't want the orgs to die. But at the same time, Alistair, you, you're you right. And Kevin, you're right in a sense that how do they do that and still make money? You know, and that's going to be up to the fans. Like the fans really do have to rally behind like our, our pros, whether they're big names or newbies. And if we keep feeding money into these orgs, keep supporting them, then it will survive. But our mentality has to change because if we keep following the same thing like, oh, well, this team doesn't have any of the big names that I recognize. I'm just not going to watch them anymore. Like, it sucks. Like, there's no double lifter Bjergsen on it, right? I mean, like, I, that's not, that's like, not good. My, my counterpoint is like, look at FlyQuest and CLG. Like, they have very cheap rosters and they did fairly well. Right, like obviously, fairly well is not exactly what like these orgs are gonna look for, but at the same time, like their pro, they probably had like a decent profit margin, and I I don't know obviously numbers, and but the way I see it, it's like it's at least something, and it's at least progress, and obviously you don't need to go five rookies, but what I my my the way I'm looking at it is like there's a reason why every other major region has teams going to worlds that are majority rookies like semi consistently and yeah. doing well yeah mad lines excluded I, it's it's <laughs> yeah, not going to be true. easy it's not going to be free and it's not going to look pretty for a while there's no answer there's no one answer there's nothing here that we could come up with in this podcast that'll fix everything all we can do is keep supporting keep talking about it and, you know, we do a lot, right? It's little. We're just four people, sort of guys out there in the world. But we do a lot. We talk about it. And we hope for the best. And we come yeah. up with whatever solution we can find. And that's our role in this, right? That's, that's all we, we can do. We, got we have yeah. to keep supporting the teams. Like I said, like, no matter what. And, I, and that's what I said. Like, I'm with the burn it down and start over mentality because – I'm willing to support it. Like I'm yeah, willing we'll to, there. yeah, I want to root for, I will be just as excited for LC. And I, what I'm saying is I hope that the rest of the community can recognize that same sentiment. Yeah. Like it's not going to look pretty hang in there because we, we need to support these teams in order for them to survive so that they can keep, you know, creating this environment where new talent can come develop and get better so that we can compete and win internationally. Um, but I agree, like it's such a good topic and it's one that we could probably talk about forever because look, we really want our, our 
region to be better. And there really is no one clear cut way. I think there's so many ways to get there, but um, that was a great final thought, by the way, uh, Kevin. Uh, I just wanted to leave us with one thing and that uh, this past weekend I got to meet there this guy. Is. You may have heard of him. His name is Travis, <laughs> Travis Gafford. Travis uh, yeah. Gaffy, huh? He's a pretty cool guy. Uh, yeah, you know, you may have heard of him. He's got a little podcast called Hotline League. Uh, he's been in the wow. scene for a while. He's wow. uh, kind of small podcast, though, right? Yeah, it's, it's just yeah. a little tiny small podcast. <laughs> you know? uh, but uh, I just did want to say and give him a shout out that I was cool. I was just walking back from actually after we uh, dispersed from meeting up, Alistair, with uh, you guys in Lotus. Like I was walking back to my seat and literally right as I was about to go in, he was just chilling just walking around i was like travis and he's like hey and i was like can i get a picture and he's like yeah sure and then uh we ended up taking a snapshot and i tweeted and he's like do i have deodorant on my shirt i was like i didn't notice it but at least you wore deodorant i was like that's cool uh but yeah man it was pretty cool pretty cool guy just meeting him for uh, a little bit you know just nice to see somebody that's you know been in the scene for so long he's like a true og you know like and so that's really cool like i i was Definitely starstruck, man. Uh, I showed my wife. I was like, I know you don't know who this is, but he's awesome. <laughs> and it's yeah. a big deal. So she was happy for me. But just wanted to put yeah. that out there uh, for my final thought. But, hey, it's going to be an exciting time this weekend. Again, I'm so happy for whoever wins. Uh, but that's going to wrap it up for us. Thanks again to my awesome co-hosts, Kevin Mitchell and Alistair, for always sharing Go your wise insights. Go Deft. <laughs> Go Deft or Faker. It doesn't matter for me. But, Go Deft. Uh, that's going to do it. Let's, uh, you know, enjoy your climb on the rift. Try not to be too toxic. And you know what? We'll see you next time. Peace. <laughs>